Thank you so much. Um, uh, so my name is Ken Catchpole. I have absolutely no clinical um, uh, qualifications at all. Um, all I've done is hang around in, in mostly, well, a lot of surgeries over the last 16 years trying to work out what's going wrong. And I'm going to give you a perspective from my field, which is called human factors. We look at the complex uh, and sometimes really weird relationships between people and systems. One of, and so all the speakers are wonderful. One of the things that they've all, they've all missed and only... Um, uh, only um, uh, uh, um, only Dr. Greg um, uh, alluded to this, is none, no one's talked about decision-making, um, which is, if you'll pardon me, quite a big piece of medical errors. Um, so um, I'm going to try and think about new ways. So the when something goes wrong, this is what happens. Um, the first thing we do is, who did this thing that went wrong? What, you know, there was a sequence of errors. What, they, what should they, how did this happen? How on earth could such a stupid thing happen? What should they have done to, uh, to resolve this? Well, um, this is how we do root cause analysis. And my argument is that this is an entirely the wrong way to do it. Um, this is, uh, this is a, an incident that was, I think, the biggest payout in UK medical history. It's not particularly an anesthesia medication error, but it's a sy syringe swap. And the summary from the legal case is, if the syringe had been marked up so the hospital could see which contained glue and which contained dye, then Maisha would not have suffered what is an utterly devastating injury. Such easily avoidable mistakes should not happen. This, is, this sort of conclusion is the consequence of this, uh, what we term uh, both hindsight bias uh, and outcome bias. Hindsight bias being, well, of course they should have done it something differently. Now we know something went wrong. And outcome bias being, well, this tragedy must mean that there was something particularly bad about it. That actually the truth is that in similar circumstances and something goes well, when somebody breaks the rules and something goes well, somebody is called a hero or it's called innovative. A ra you know, it's only when it goes bad in the context of things that we associate these behaviours um, with something being bad. So the point here is that maybe it's more insightful uh, to say, how did this seem reasonable at the time? This person did not come, people do not come to work to make drugs errors. So the reason why they make all the wrong decisions in this chain that leads to this is actually the key to understanding how to prevent it. Not saying afterwards, well, if only they'd done what I said they should, should have done. The question is, why do people not use barcode systems? Why do people uh, not do the checks that they should do, be doing? Why do people make the wrong decisions that lead to the to, to to the, um, uh, to the wrong care. And so working backwards and saying, well, we should do things differently um, doesn't satisfy actually any of these, uh, these particular things. So this is what we call reconstruction of the mindset, getting into the head of the person around why they made the decisions that led to the thing in the first place, rather than telling them what sh they should have done afterwards. Um, because in the, I was in that route, by the way, and I use this example because I was working with that operating team in the same unit 18 months before, and all of these red things are things that were going wrong within the environment that actually ended up predisposing um, what was um, nearly a syringe swap between uh, uh, chirocaine um, and, um, and saline that was rescued um, by uh, a particularly vigilant nurse who says, no, 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 stop, don't do that. So the point here is, the, 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 there are two points here I'm going to build on, one of which is um, that the world is really, really messy, and thinking about it as if it's not messy is going to be entirely, uh, is going to lead us down the wrong way. As, um, uh, as, as Dr. Greg was, Greg was saying, um, uh, you know, even, uh, even getting the right supply of the right vials uh, is difficult. So if you ba base a system on that, then it's going to be a challenge. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll move on from that. Um, Oh, that's right. The other thing is that um, what, we, what it doesn't tell us is why things, what this might tell us is why things go wrong most of the time. So in human factors, what we talk about is the difference between safety one and safety two. Safety one is this old way of looking at things, what went wrong and why. Safety two says, why does it 95% of the time go right? And if we can understand why most of the time it goes right, maybe that will tell us more about the, the unique situations in why it goes wrong. And I can tell you that by and large, we do not understand how our systems deliver the, 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 uh, the performance that they do deliver um, because nobody spends the time to look at why, why it goes right. Um, so um, 
the implications are with safety two versus safety one is safety one is about making as few things go as possible go wrong, and safety two is about making as many things go right. Um, that safety one is reactive, we respond when things go bad. Safety two is proactive, saying, well, let's, work, let's understand what it is that we're doing right and do more of that all the time, rather than waiting until something goes wrong for, um, to, to do something about it. And the view of the human, and this is actually key, we like to think, and I hear this all the time, that the humans are the weak part of the system. No, they're the strong part of the system, they hold the system together, they're not the weak part. Um, and safety one says humans are a liability or a hazard. We've got to stop them doing bad things. Safety two says, no, they're actually a fundamental resource and they're what tie all these disparate and not very functional components together to make our, our sort of creaky uh, and, um, and challenging and complex systems work. And so, uh, so uh, the idea that we can make enough rules to stop people doing bad things is absolute garbage. We can make rules to help people do the work, but, but we're not going to stop errors through, uh, through the sort of safety one. Um, so then we get onto the second sort of con or another concept here, which is called workers imagined versus workers done. Workers imagined, and uh, this is this is uh, this is an example of workers imagined. It looks like no operating room I've ever been, nor you will, nor will any of us ever be in. Um, this is uh, um, this is a bit more like a real operating room, uh, and these are some of the photos I've taken of real operating rooms and the challenges simply in just delivering care every day that we have to deal with. So this is work, the difference between workers imagined and workers done, and it has implications. Um, and I don't have time to go into that. You know, the, the idea that, that, oh, well, if only we had the perfect system, uh, then everything would go right. No, uh, that's, not, that's not the case. Um, and I will take the, the one idea down the bottom. That workers imagined is that somehow we can have enough policies, there's a bureaucratic mechanism um, by which we can, or technocratic mechanism by which we can make all this thing, this stuff work. Well, whereas actually, work as done is that all the time, all of us are, are trading safety, cost, and, uh, and throughput or efficiency. We're always trying to do that all the time. That's why people uh, drive faster on the road. It's why uh, Boeing did not respond to, uh, to the safety critical incidents as quickly as they could have done because we all, we're all the time having to balance uh, our perceptions of risk with our perceptions of what we need to do with the costs of doing it. And that's one of the things that humans do really well. And when things go wrong, it's because something, somewhere along the line, we've asked people to do too much, and maybe that they don't have a full perception of the risk they're running by doing something different. Um, so anyway, workers imagine what work, work has done tells us all sorts of interesting things about why we're getting this wrong and why top-down interventions don't work very effectively. Um, this, is, um, this is actually um, uh, to build on the, the, the process mapping and pre-filled syringes talked about earlier. This is, um, this is a sort of uh, a process map um, um, based on a neat little study from um, one of my colleagues um, uh, around, uh, around the, 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 the risk reduction that you get with pre-filled syringes. However, what these process maps don't demonstrate is actually how complex the interactions between all these different people are and how information flows around them simply to be able to do the, to do the job appropriately. One of the limitations of these very linear, you know, FMEA has, a, has great advantages, but it's, it's, it's linear and, uh, and doesn't really take into account how complex all the information moving around is um, and, and all the implications there are for, for performance. Um, uh, and indeed, one of the things we were asked to talk about is, is time pressures, the performance shaping factors that adapt those, um, uh, those processes all the time, the working environment, teen interactions, the different types of, uh, the different types of risks that different sorts of anesthetic practice create. Um, uh, the, um, uh, in fact, Karen talked about the, the significant difference in, uh, in the um, significant differences in the sort of error rates associated with different sorts of surgeries. Um, so, uh, so these are what we call performance shaping factors that they're what adapt our ability as human beings to do the work. Um, the final thing I'm going to talk about is around decision making. Um, so this, there's a really neat concept um, uh, that I'm, I'm currently applying in my own research called natural, naturalistic decision making. 
um, which is about how people make decisions and form cognitively complex functions in demanding real-world situations where we have limited time, uncertainty, high stakes, uh, team and organizational constraints, un uh, unstable conditions, and varying amounts of experience. Now, to me, that actually s s says very directly this is, this is the sort of decision-making that anesthesiologists in part particular are doing. Uh, and there's this thing called rec recognition prime decision-making, which tells us, you know, which, which sort of starts to group some of these decisions, um, you know, in that we have, uh, uh, I under, you know, uh, the variation one is if then uh, I understand that, that this is the situation and I know what I need to do, or um, I don't understand the situation but I know what I need to do to, to, to get to, to, to solve it, or um, I, um, I understand what the situation is but I don't know how to solve it. Um, so these are some of the deci different decisions that, uh, that, that you as clinicians uh, and, and me as a human being have to make all the time. Um, and so what, what, what this whole literature around naturalistic decision making, um, which is decision making done by real people, it started off with looking at actually how, um, how, uh, how, how fire, uh, you know, how, how fire, 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 fire people, um, uh, what's, what's, the word, what's the US word? Um, uh, uh, um, yeah, thank you. Firefighters, uh, how they make decisions um, in these complex and dynamically changing environments. Um, and so, uh, so it tells us some things about, uh, about maybe our, uh, our assumptions around classical decision might be, right, might be wrong, that we do not. The, you know, the only way to make good decisions is not to select from several options and pick the best one. That's not actually how experts make decisions. They draw on patterns to handle a time pressure and never actually really compare options. And I think you'll find this in your own practice, that you don't systematically go through. Now, this isn't a bad thing. Um, expertise is not based on learning and rules, but it kind of depends on tacit knowledge, the stuff that I can't really teach you that comes from experience. That's why it, do it doesn't matter how many protocols we have, there's not enough ways, uh, you know, that, that actually the, the, the way to become an expert in anesthesiology is to do a lot of anesthesia. Um, uh, that people make sense of events by building up data from information to knowledge and understanding. No, actually what people do is reject a whole bunch of... Um, uh, of unnecessary data at the start based on their expertise. I know that that piece of information isn't going to help me make my decision. And indeed, this leads to this, you know, one of the things that's the sort of, uh, what's the, the, uh, the tyranny of uh, the information age is that somehow we think that if you provide people with more information, they'll be able to make better decisions. Actually, the opposite is true. If you provide people with a whole ton of information, it can actually reduce their ability and frequently reduces their ability uh, to make decisions. Um, uh, so, um, so that's some, yeah, so, so this has implications. Uh, and all this stuff I'm trying to build, I'm building into uh, an ARC funded project um, that we've just started, um, looking firstly at how, um, how anesthesiologists make decisions in the first place. Secondly, how uh, they execute on those decisions in some of the ways we've been thinking about. Um, and thirdly, the things in the environment that can adapt both of those um, and the, the ways in which, uh, in which that happens. Um, so better ways, um, maybe combining safety two and safety one, so not just looking at what goes wrong, but looking at what goes right. Um, do not work, do not do, do not work in work as imagined. Work, think about work as done. That involves hanging around in clinical areas, and I know you guys do that all the time. But that in involves making decisions based on not what you would like to see, but actually the real challenges of doing everyday work and recognizing that the world is a dirty, messy place, and, and, uh, and safety uh, is, uh, you know, is achieved by understanding that. Um, I would suggest that class the classical decision-making model needs, you know, the, the, that I see in a lot of the clinical literature, actually would benefit from understanding the real messy complexity of naturalistic decision-making, not treating human beings like machines, but actually treat, treating them in a much more, uh, in, in, a, in a way that reflects the sophistication of the decision-making that's going on. Um, and I will also, there are a bunch of things I didn't, <laughs> I was able to ask, uh, distributed cognition, that what we do is distributed amongst us, and it's not about one individual's performance or decision-making. 
um, that we live in a complex and adaptive world, not a linear and deterministic world. So when I make a change in a complex system, it might have all sorts of weird and wonderful effects. There's not a linear relationship between errors and outcomes. So, you know, so uh, that calls into the question the whole thing about whether we should be doing RCTs uh, around error, pre uh, error prevention studies. Um, and, uh, and I would also say that one of the challenges we have uh, in, in doing this in anesthesia is, is getting over this idea that one size fits all. It doesn't. There are so many different contexts in which anesthesia is delivered. If we don't understand what those are and design for those different contexts, or indeed design ways in which to make decisions about those different contexts, then we're going to end up with a sort of generic solution that doesn't really suit anyone. Um, thank you very much. I hope that's been of interest. <laughs> I could have the uh, panelists come back up and uh, as you uh, synthesize maybe some questions or comments, um, there's uh, just a few, I guess, observations that I would make. Um, one is, I just, with a show of hands, how many people are routinely using pre-filled syringes, at least for the uh, bulk of their routine medications in the OR on a day-to-day -day basis? So that looks like... A minority, maybe 25 percent or so. Um, uh, we we transitioned to the uh, drugs ready for administration um, with a commercial vendor, uh, primarily. And uh, I'd have to say, of the advances that I've seen uh, in my five or ten years of anesthesia experience, um, I, I think this is one of the major advances in patient safety. Is um, it's just uh, every syringe, every label, every drug that you're used to and want to use, it looks the same every day, every case, every situation. And it doesn't matter where you're at within uh, you know, the operating room environment, every room has the exact same layout with, that, with those syringes. So um, it, uh, it, it may have some incremental cost, but uh, I think it is one of the, the big leaps forward that you should consider. Um, the other comment, just uh, I'm glad Ken brought up the uh, safety to or resilience concept. Um, one of those elements within that is a uh, acronym called ETTO, E-T-T-O, which is maybe not an acronym you're familiar with, but you're very familiar with the concept. Uh, ETTO is efficiency, thoroughness, trade-off. And uh, in, in the terms of working in the operating room, um, this is, are you going to go slowly and be careful as you label and pull out your syringes, or do you have to hurry, 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 they want to get the next case in here right away? Um, so that just uh, obviously oversimplifies it, but... Um, this is so much at the, uh, the core of what we are challenged with every day, uh, you know, both individually and uh, organizationally, is how fast can, and how hard can you push people before you're going to start to see, instead of efficiency, you're going to uh, be compromising thoroughness. And indeed, we all struggle with that every day. So with that, um, uh, question here. Yeah, thank you very much. Derek Sakata, University of Utah. First of all, I have to let you know that my father was ultimately killed because of a drug error. Mm -hmm. So there is that. Uh, I'm vice chair for perioperative innovations at the University of Utah Anesthesiology. I'm also, I'm also hospital administration. I am also a, a, a company as well who has medical devices. So on the anesthesia front, uh, I guess the question would be what Cooper had proposed in 1978 about reducing drug errors by 50% between 2000 and 2005. First question is, have we gotten there? And why haven't we gotten there? The second one, as a hospital administrator also, I want you all to work faster, harder, with less resources. <laughs> that, that's the way it is, right? We had a drug error in our, in, our, in our eye center where we moved like this. We changed from a topical to a general. A medication was administered that a patient was harmed, um, not, not you know, complete forever, but was harmed. We went through all this analysis on this, so I appreciate that. As industry, 
as an engineer, I'm also trained as an engineer, we do F FMEA analysis for all products we put out. We look at every single way that any one of you are going to screw up what we've designed for you all. Because as an engineer, I don't trust humans. I don't trust me as a human. As an anesthesiologist, I feel like I don't make errors. So I balance that very much. So as a, as a, as a company, we've, we've designed several devices. I also work with BD and Teleport. I have not been paid by them, so I have no conflict of interest. But I believe that their device may help with some of this. We can asymptotically get to zero. We will never get to zero, but we sure should try. So, from, for, so first, have we gotten there 50%? Second, as I look at my company to work on the next product, this is something I want to go after, and I've talked to our company about this. What can we do to help from an engineering perspective? Not, I'm not a pharmacologist, though. So I love the IntelliPort concept, and for those of you that don't know it, it's actually a device that has a barcode reader and an ultrasound. So when you put your syringe into the lure lock that's there, it reads the barcode, splash screen, audible, concentration as well as the drug name, and then as you give it, it can monitor the volume that's administered, and it's quite accurate down to uh, small volumes. But what I'd actually see is another addition to that is that the, so it's a unique tube from the syringe to your IV tubing. I would like to see a cutoff valve. So if the patient's allergic, boom, it doesn't open. Or if the con it's a concentrated medication, it doesn't even open to allow you to administer the drug. I'm also a hospital administrator, and Rich says that we've gone to uh, pre-field syringes, but every three to four years, we have to fight off an attack from our finance people and our pharmacy saying that we're going back to the vials and we'll be preparing them. So my answer to have we achieved any change, I don't think we've really even touched medication error um, since Cooper's paper. I don't know. Um, uh, I I'll, I'll, I'll put it in a different way. That, that actually what, what, what will happen is that we've, uh, we may well have got safer and better at delivering, but to your point, when that happens, there's always a, a, a balance. It's sort of called risk homeostasis. Uh, the idea that if you have a car with all the amazing safety features, you drive faster because um, it keeps the risk about the same. The same goes for um, uh, uh, the same goes for, for healthcare. That yeah, we probably we you know we can get better at reducing some of these errors, but then they go up again because we're doing more, um, and we're always balancing uh, throughput, cost, and safety. Uh, and, and I think, um, so I think uh, one of the, the reasons why we, we aren't failing, we are failing to make any progress is that the people who are making the decisions at the top of the organization don't recognize always the impact that they're going to have on safety. As you say, that, that, that there's this disconnect between errors, which are bad people doing bad things, and, uh, and my, des you know, my desire as an administrator to do more for less, which means that I'm going to make people do more and, and not give them the resources to do that. And there's a disconnect between that thinking. And I would also encourage you not to think about, uh, I would I encourage you not to think about people being the bad thing. Um, that actually the, the way we need to think about this is the integration of the technologies and the human being. That stopping the prevent, there's a whole history of how that sort of thinking of, well, we need to take things away from bad human beings has led to increasing complexity uh, and, you know, and, uh, and increasing level uh, and increasingly severe disasters. Um, uh, uh, and so, uh, I, so I, I would actually encourage you to sort of go beyond that thinking and say, how do we find the right mix of technology and people and processes that is going to make uh, that, that, that is going to make uh, our efficiency and thoroughness? And and why, and to, to specifically focus on the te in, in teleport, uh, the teleport I think is a is a reasonable idea. My concern is that what it does is it relocates effort and work and errors to other parts of the system um, without really addressing the the key problem. There's a number of uh, and, and that that speaks to what we know about. Um, accidents where increasing complexity leads actually to more errors rather than less. Speaking, speaking of human beings, I just um, we know with these barcode readers, um, when you install these expensive systems, people don't want to use them. And we've had that experience uh, with a colleague out in uh, Seattle um, where they had to take to bribing people um, with little um, 
coffee cards. Uh, automated money cards in order to get people to use the, the devices that were th sitting there in the operating room. Well, the, so the, this is a, a classic example of technology that doesn't meet the needs of the actual front end users, yeah, the question, at least in its current reiteration. The question is why, why, why are people not using it? There's a reason. Um, right. uh, you know, and if you if you look at, for example, the the automated cars that you know, and and, and Teslas and the problems they have, that's they're having. That's because the the the, the automation is being used in inappropriate in inappropriate ways. But I'm older, and I actually was a teenager when seat belts were introduced. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, we drove all around the country sleeping on the back seat and whatnot without ever thinking about a seat belt. There was a huge <laughs> resistance, and people buckled the seat belt behind them because they didn't want to use the seatbelt. So anytime a new technology comes in, it's partly, I don't need this yeah. because I'm not going to make yeah. an error. Yeah, that's right. And it's going to make my life harder. It's going to take me eight seconds to buckle my seatbelt, and yeah. we don't do it. Yeah, yeah it's a ri that's, that's the yeah, risk, mm -hmm. risk perception thing. Yeah. I, I think with barcoding, too, it's not just getting people to, to use the system, but um, it's actually a change in the order of steps, because right now we document after we administer a medication. The only way for barcoding to actually be effective and to help is if that scan happens before the medication is administered or reaches the patient. So it's an important um, change in workflow that, that people have to be on board with. Yeah. And that's one thing I like about the BD is that if you use the correct injection port, it's automatically barcoded. So you don't have the extra step of holding it to the barcode mm -hmm. reader. It's part of the, mm -hmm. um, and no, I, BD doesn't pay me either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on. Next question. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Barry. Uh, I'm from the University of Michigan, i um, a clinician. Uh, and this is addressed uh, to all of the panelists, uh, please. Um, for those of us who are involved in the formation of young physicians, in terms of thinking about um, interests, since medicine is a multidisciplinary field intellectually, uh, what fields, uh, obviously psychology, engineering, aviation, all of these fields have things to teach us. What field, if you were to select one, do you think we have the most to learn from? Uh, if each of you could address that. Thank you. Hmm. Elliot, you yeah. want to give uh, uh, It's uh, certainly uh, not airlines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was at a panel where the, one of the panelists said, if anybody says airlines to me, I'm going to shoot them. And then I had to say airlines. And the disconnect is that flying an airplane represents a complicated system. So there are many individual critical steps, but the steps are the same for every takeoff and every landing, pretty much. Medicine is complex. It's like predicting the weather. Even as we're predicting the weather, the weather is changing. So airlines, complicated, Healthcare complex, and it's a big difference. So I'm probably going to give the wrong answer, but um, I study art history in college, and while I've talked a little bit about borrowing various methods like failure mode effects analysis and all these things from airlines and nuclear and other industries, um, I've actually found the most useful was some of my art training because there's a lot of emphasis on seeing and looking at the world, and I didn't really mention it, but the, the, the reason I had a little green man on my um, presentation was uh, it reminds me to try to be objective. And as we are raised through this apprenticeship model of residency, et cetera, it's very easy to take on the assumptions of our predecessors. Um, and actually, I really like the light bulb analogy at the very beginning, this idea that sometimes you need to step back return to first principles and think about why we're doing what we're doing and what we're really hoping to accomplish. And I think the ability to kind of step outside of ourselves and really look at things anew is what will in part allow us to make some significant changes rather than just chipping away at current processes. This might be cheating because it's broad, but <laughs> I would say that um, systems engineering and human factors is very directly applicable to what we do in the operating room. Um, and they have a lot of um, very 
well thought out processes and methods to assess situations and um, continuous improvement methodologies that are very applicable to us in the operating room. Uh, um, I, I would actually agree with every single, uh, every <laughs> single response. I think they're all absolutely perfect. Um, uh, complex systems. Um, <laughs> what, did you, what did you say? Um, uh, um, thank you. Yeah, the, um, and um, uh, but um, and systems engineering and human factors. Um, and and I, I so to add something, I'm going to say I would love. Uh, you know, I think we need to understand more about um, how uh, decision making is made. Um, uh, the, the sort of way clinical decision making is talked about is which randomized controlled trial shows the, shows the best evidence for the best treatment option. That's not how people make decisions. And so the idea that we would call that sort of clinical decision making um, is frustrating to me as somebody who's, uh, who's very much interested in the real ways in which people make decisions. And that feeds into all these different things because at the center of the system is a human being. And that, and that isn't going to go away and it shouldn't go away uh, and so if we understand what the human being is doing in their brain, then everything else will stem from that. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question. Great. Uh, thank you all very much. I thought that was, uh, those were fantastic presentations. Uh, my name is Josh Bloomstone. I am an anesthesiologist. Uh, I am the Associate Medical Director uh, for the Envision Center for Patient uh, Safety and Quality. We uh, receive over two and a half million anesthetics worth of data annually. Uh, I'd like to say that I completely believe in 5S, and I think it requires, uh, you know, anesthesiologists uh, should implement uh, exactly the sorts of tools you were talking about. I completely agree self-reporting is a very bad idea. I completely agree that human factors uh, are um, critical and that root cause analysis as typically applied in industry uh, is uh, actually less useful, I think, in our assessment of error, yet the Joint Commission continues uh, to require root cause analysis as the major methodology for doing so. Um, I'd like to, and finally, the error-proofing concept, absolutely, we spend too much time putting signs up. Uh, however, uh, in your slides, many of you used mistake and error, and I believe those two elements are actually completely different. And the way in which one um, uh, uh, error-proofs against errors versus error-proofing against mistakes is different. The analysis is different. And so I'd like to ask you a little bit more about are medication errors errors, or are they mistakes, or are they sometimes both? And how do we approach it? Thanks. I'll I'll try to take that first. Um, first, I want to clarify, I think incident reporting is great. It just doesn't give us accurate medication error rates. Um, but it, it's great for um, types of errors, especially rare events, to get a sense of what's going on. But if we want a true sense of medication error rates, um, there are other methods that are better. Um, Regarding, uh, regarding the question about um, the origin of, of the errors that we're seeing, um, so one of the things that our study found was that um, error rates were not um, associated with um, provider type, resident, nurse, attending anesthesiologist, level of experience, anything like that. That suggests that these are not really knowledge-based um, errors that are occurring. These are more... Um, related to the system and in the environment we're working in. So it doesn't matter if you've been working for 20 years or if you're, you know, nearing the end of your training. Um, the error rates that we found were pretty consistent. Um, so I think that speaks to a little bit about, about it not really being a knowledge thing. So um, not being clear about how you would define error versus mistake, I'm actually going to step back and say this is, this is a big problem, that actually as soon as you start looking at errors and what is an error, it's always couched within hindsight bias, particularly in healthcare, and is a very slippery fish that, that will probably disappear in a puff of smoke. Um, and the reason why that is, and, and, uh, and one of the reasons why that is, is that in healthcare, um, as opposed to all these other industries and why fundamentally the, those models don't work, um, is, that, um, uh, is that all of those industries are designed, have been engineered to achieve a certain outcome. Um, 
Uh, and so we know the engineering tolerances associate or what we need to do to achieve certain outcomes. Now in healthcare, the outcome that, we're going, that we want to achieve is fundamentally um, we can't achieve it. We will, you know, we can't stop people from dying. Um, and so in that context, then, what, what are the engineering toler tolerances for that? Well, we don't know, actually, also because nobody ever engineered them. And if we don't know what the engineering tolerance is, we don't know, actually, what an error really is. And it's only ever couched in something went wrong, somebody must have done something wrong. So it's always um, afflicted with hindsight bias. And all the definitions we have, you know, people in the press, we talk about medical errors being injuries. You know, there's adverse events. There's, you know, there's whether, you know, is it... Is it an error to, um, to not label a syringe, or is it a deliberate thing, you know, for, for, all, sort, you know, for, for all sorts of weird reasons that might, you know, might be entirely appropriate in the head of the individual, but, uh, but, but it's deliberate nonetheless. So, so actually, the point you're getting at to me is that, yeah, the errors actually are very, very difficult to define and disappear in a puff of smoke when you really try and nail down what it is, which is why I decided in our grant not to look at errors, but actually to look at Right, what, you know, how do people make decisions and not making a judgment about whether that decision is appropriate or not, but looking at the context in which the best performance is likely to be achieved, not thinking about, well, we, we didn't achieve what we wanted to achieve, that must be an error, how do we stop those things happening? Great. And I'll agree, you know, the, I'm not quite sure what the definition between error and mistake is, but I want to highlight a lot of the things that Ken's talked about 15 or 20 years ago, those of us in healthcare really hadn't even read James Reason's book. We didn't even know the very simple skill-based, uh, rule-based, knowledge-based errors, but that was our framework. It was a pretty simplistic framework, and we've really moved on to this a much more complex and robust understanding about how we think and how we make decisions. And it's a, it's a needed evolution, but I think we're still in our infancy of understanding that, and I think our human factors and our cognitive psychologists will be a critical part of that. We won't be comparing ourselves so much to aviation anymore. We'll see ourselves as a unique context where most of those rules do not apply. We just don't have rules that we have that we understand right now. So thanks to the people I, like Ken who are helping us understand it. We may have time for one last <laughs> question here. Yeah. Uh, Michael O'Connor, University of Chicago, uh, Luddite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a couple of comments. Um, the first of which is uh, I actually regard the performance of my peers as astonishingly good. They all work in incredibly adverse circumstances. Yeah. And in spite of the fact that you have completely failed to measure the rate of what you call error or mistakes, right, it is, in fact, astonishingly low. Very and all of that is, in fact, the fault of the very practitioners that are the targets of these witch hunts. The second thing I'm going to argue is that um, I think we should forbid people from trying to measure the rate at which these things happen and instead tell them that if they aren't trying to understand how they happen and how they might be mitigated, that they're wasting everybody's time and attention. Um, and we should stop talking about the rate. The third comment I'm going to have um, is that um, for myself, um, <clears throat> I'm a great believer uh, in a variety of things, but one of them is like the whole barcode medication administration thing. You know, I work in the ICU. And I have nurses who have two patients who have seven medications that are all due at 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. And their administrators do nothing but audit the timely administration of this stuff. And as a consequence, they all, in fact, scar scan the barcodes at 10 a.m. <laughs> and then they cool. administer them as they will. So in fact, the barcode, and by the way, this is not, this is not news. This was documented by Emily Patterson, a legitimate human factors uh, researcher, more than 20 years ago in the literature. This is not new data. Everybody knew that this should and is going to happen, right? And, and so we have this astonishing ignorance of the prior art. And, and still, it's, you know, 2019, right? And we still act like that never happened. I mean, you know, and, and the idea that this somehow supports or prevents, no, actually, it's been weaponized um, in a way that, in fact, has degraded all of the value it might have added at the bedside. And, and so this is a perfect example of work as imagined versus work as done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And so barcode medication administration, to me, is an icon of work as imagined. It has right. never fit the workflow of anybody right. who actually works at the bedside. 
Thank you. I think we'll have to leave it at that. We got some other. <laughs>